very fair client and always seeking for the best creative work and always pushing the envelope. But I think that uh, from your standpoint, uh, you, you, you should tell us a little bit more what you're expecting from the creative community and how are you uh, capable of getting from that community so great work that we can see all the time. Okay, I think it's a very uh, pertinent question. I mean, first, uh, creativity is a decision. Uh, it sounds very basic, but at the end of the day, if you want to get creativity, you have to decide that you want it, and that is a consequent decision. And then you have to be asking for it, because very often, our people in the industry, and I'm not talking only about Heineken, oftentimes fail to get the creativity from agencies because they don't demand it. They don't ask for it. And I hold the belief, you're going to love that, but you're going to, I hold the belief that actually you get the creativity you deserve in the final end. When a client buys poor work, that means that work is good enough for them. So I think it starts with an expectation. It starts with a decision. And why do I say decision? Because creativity is risky. And companies are not wired for risk. They're wired for control. So this is why when, whenever it gets to innovation and creativity, you always have tension in the system. And that's why I call it a decision. In terms of how do you get the most out of creative agencies is um, there are agencies which are more or less talented than others. Um, I hold a bit of an unorthodox view that the most important relationship with an agency is the, creation, is the relation between the client and the creative. And that's why for me, when it gets to the brands that I control, not all of them of course, is when I understand that the creative understands my brand and understands what I need, this is when it's a decision to work together. And then it's gonna be a process. We're gonna be together in the kitchen sometimes. We're gonna disagree sometimes. We're gonna be furious at each other sometimes. But this is how excellence is made. And this is where people feel they are also part of your brand as opposed to just delivering to, to a client on a brief. And this is, in my experience, what got the most out of them. Would you uh, agree uh, with something that they have been uh, a a witness, uh, w w which was the time of Freddy and uh, immediately following Freddy Heineken, uh, where he, he, he would never take an ad for pre-testing and saying, I have to feel it in my guts. And sometimes when uh, pre-testing have been made, he has decided against the test. Would you agree that uh, this is a, a process which can be applied at uh, Heineken? Yeah. Or I is think, it something which is impossible to think I in think nowadays? I think I'm about to make myself popular with this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Please. No, do. I think I actually believe that ultimately advertising, like creativity, is a decision. The trouble with the marketing function is that you cannot quantify yourself to death, it's just not possible. That's what makes marketing difficult. It is, the, it is one of the few professions when science and art always are together. You know, when you think about IT, when you think about, you know, supply chain, there is always a spreadsheet that will conclude something which is obvious. You will never have sometimes, maybe I'm oversimplifying. No, 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 no. no. But in marketing or in innovation, because I understand you come from IT, Right. Yes, I, I have an IT background. Yeah, and, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's you didn't know not, that, did you? Uh, <laughs> anyway, the, this was in the 18th century. <laughs> uh, 19. <laughs> no, the 19th was the, 19, uh, another an, another background. So, so basically, um, testing is oftentimes to to respond to some hypotheses. For example, um, is that kind of casting considered attractive in Indonesia? Is that woman beautiful? That is something on judgment. If you're not part of the culture, you can't tell. Is that behavior aspirational? That you can't tell. But creativity, no way on earth. We decide what is creative and what is acceptable and what is on brand equity. No test in the world will answer that. And very often we've had tests and we've decided against test results. Wow. Oh. Oh.
Jean-François, as the yeah. yes, you wanted to be popular, yeah, so exactly. uh, you are telling lies to the crowd. So that's it's good. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Jean-François, uh, you yourself, how much are you involved in uh, uh, the decision on how to position a brand or the creative work? Are you giving a leeway to? Alexis says, okay, Alexis, this is your job, and they want to see only this, this. Or uh, is there a kind of uh, uh, committee or whatever where you are exchanging, discussing? Certainly not the word committee. Because ah, if voilà. you start to make advertising in a committee, then you're dead. So now I want to be popular here. Um, <laughs> It's not, it's not in a spirit of competition with Alexis, but I think if the CEO starts to do the marketing instead of its uh, chief marketing officer, then we go in the wrong, the wrong place, obviously. So I think it's essentially uh, the chief marketing who does it. It's always a combination. When, when you talk about a global brand, um, you call in for one guy who is ultimately to make the arbitration. In that respect, my role will be more of a kind of a veto role, which I did not have to exercise, so that's the good news. Um, but I would reserve as a CEO just a veto right for uh, things when they come out of the gates. Um, but that is just a more hygienic uh, stuff, if you will. I think it's important to have a creative team within the company who understand the brand and who can work with an agency there is nothing, and I think Alexis said, and I said it, say it again, in other words, there is nothing more lethal for a company to have marketeers who are just doing quantitative analysis and all kinds of research, write a brief. When I look at the brief of a, a beer brand, nothing resembles more one brief from another brief, and then it goes to the agency, and if you leave the creative people of the agency to do everything themselves, you're going to have something which belongs to the advertising agency and not to, not to the company. A beer brand is 80% emotion. And in those emotion, you have a lot of history. Most of the beer brands are around for over 100 years. So, and they have to respect their DNA, and they have to project themselves into the future and being every day aspirational. For that, you need a creative team in-house under the leadership of your chief marketing officer, totally empowered. And I know for, for Heineken that Alexis has a keen eye on um, how the processes are going on, but he also delegates quite a lot to the people who are responsible for the Heineken brands. Some of them are even in the room here. I spotted one. Sandrine, hello. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's about being a professional, but having a, a keen understanding of the brand and having a judgment. And somewhere, Individuals put a style. I, I would like to make a parallel with the fashion uh, world, which I'm a little bit alien to. But um, think about a brand like Gucci, historically, how that was changed by Tom Ford. And somewhere he didn't destroy the DNA of that brand, but he repositioned the brand for a much brighter future. And somewhere you have to make an act of faith in a guy like Tom Ford who took over the Gucci brand. Now, we do that the same with a brand like Heineken. You have to do an act of faith in your marketing director, in your chief marketing officer and his team to bring that brand forward to the next step. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Uh, Alexei, part of uh, Heineken has, in his history, has been always to be innovative. And uh, how are you dealing now with the, the new media, all these uh, uh, social networks where it is a little bit complicated when it comes to alcohol uh, and how are you dealing with uh, all this innovation stuff which is coming up? Yeah, I would say the, the, it's a very pertinent huh, question uh, for today. I would say the, one, the first answer I give you is that we learn intensively. I don't think anybody uh, understood the full media evolution equation because it's in full motion and it changes every day. In this, there are lots of fads, and there is a lot of vanity. I do hear spectacular uh, pronouncements from here and there. We're going to stop traditional advertising, and we're only digital, and all that kind of stuff. I don't believe that for a second. I think today, the separation, a hermetic separation, between conventional communication and new media is totally artificial. 
It's totally artificial. Today, consumers just consume more media. That's it. They just consume more of it. They're in front of the TV. They do the iPad. They're on their phone, like most of you are right now, by the way. And that's the reality of today. They're taking pictures of yeah, you. Yeah, that's yeah. the reason why they, they have the <laughs> iPad and they have their iPhones. But that's the reality or of today. Or the Samsung or the Blackberry. But the That's <laughs> being cautious. So, so that's, uh, that's the reality of today. So every <laughs> so uh, that's the reality of today. It's all one bag. And what we have as marketers to come to terms with, it just became much more complicated. And we learn every day, we adapt every day, but I will never believe for a second that the 40 second or 30 second video spot is dead. It is not dead and it will not die. It might be seen through different media than a TV box, but this is the ultimate format of communication because it talks to all the senses and it's the one that reaches emotions the most effectively. You are running for election. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, you, you are doing your best, uh, or you are looking for a job as CEO of an agency, and in that case we will have a conversation. Uh, You're I not think... a bad campaign manager, by the way. <laughs> uh, I, I have, uh, before giving the floor to uh, uh, our uh, audience, I think it should be interesting uh, uh, to, to know what is you you have been in various uh, advertisers at least I know two of them who are very different um, how are you managing an agency today compared to when you were in your previous job what is the, what are the key differences between uh, being a, in a large packaged goods company and uh, a, a brand which is at the core of a family-owned company and carrying most of the value and the DNA of this family and the company. The, um, the relationship for building brands, the relationship with an agency is organic and it has to be organic. If it becomes a cold, over-processed clinical relationship, you don't get the most out of agencies. And ultimately, how do you know you're getting the most out of, out of an agency is when the creatives fight inside the agency to work on your business. When you know you're the client that creatives inside the agency, despite the polite smiles, are the, shun you, then you know that you're not in a good place. So this is why I find the, the relation with the creatives, a personal relation with the creatives, is very important. With all respect to all hierarchies that we have, all the creatives that work on the Heineken brand, on global brands, and frankly, on a few big local brands in which we intervene from the sidelines, of course, just to enable the process because local brands should be managed locally, they all know that I, together with the brand directors, are always a phone call away. And I find that personal relationship much more conducive to good work and importantly, to spontaneous conversations because it is through spontaneous conversations that trickles start and sparkles start. And then one idea leads the other. We're not in the business of science, we're in the business of art. We are in the business today of science and art because uh, the, the big media, the big data uh, and all the internet has uh, bringing us a lot of numbers, but I agree fully we are above all in the business of delivering emotions no. and that is art. Okay, we will uh, have the light on if that is possible. Peut-on allumer la salle? And we will have uh, uh, the audience uh, putting directly some questions to Jean-François or to Alexis. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate. Sandrine, you can't. Closed 
You know, it's um, what is what is beautiful um, in the evolution of the media scene today. Um, it's that scale in communication matters less than before. If you have a cool idea, it sticks, and it travels on its own merit, and that is that advantages those who are really interesting and creative. Uh, and there is some nice element of democracy in it, which is, which is refreshing, it's merit in the final end. And I would say by a, an imperfect extension, that logic also applies to restrictions. Even in restricted environments, when work is really, really creative, like what we've done with the sunrise, um, it, it sticks and it travels, which is, which is the good news. Now to answer your question on storytelling itself, and we said it yesterday and I'll repeat it today, there are fads in the world. And of course, every two, three years, we have a new theme that we follow. But the beauty with these themes is that there is always a residual element that stays with us. And why storytelling is important today? Because it talks to consumer more easily. We're all born with stories. This is how we were born. This is how we saw light the first hours of our life. And we were all children. So it speaks to us. We're conditioned for that. And storytelling travels today to the point of Maurice. We are flooded with data. I mean, the amount just to get data organized around your head is a full-time job today. And the beauty with a nice story that talks to the heart is that it cuts through all that jungle. So this is why we have to drive storytelling in our advertising. And stories are simple. And as Yves Corbet yesterday, I don't know if Yves is here or not, but he said something which is wonderful that really stuck with me. You should not do storytelling. You should do story whispering. Because ah. when you whisper a story, you let the consumer the imagination to imagine and participate in your story. Give Eve a hand, please. <laughs> okay. Next, yes. <laughs> we'll give you you one have not got end. one? Uh, you should. Okay. Uh, Alexei, you have not organized this? Uh, I am sure we can organize. We're a very spontaneous company. That will be dealt with immediately okay. after the session. It, so you will get one. Okay. I know they'll be here. Uh, the three biggest mistakes you did. What? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, no, he, none, none. I made more than you? three mistakes. No, uh, no. But I'll tell you a couple of, of mistakes I've made. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I made was um, I was swayed one time in my career. Um, I don't want to give specifics of the event, uh, but I was swayed into taking a conventional route when a competitor changed the game in the, in, the, in the category, I was working in beauty care, and there is a competitor that entirely changed the game uh, and started communicating on a different panel. I think the clever ones of you will realize what I'm talking about. Um, and I was swayed in following them on the same terrain, even though I didn't believe it. And that was a mistake. And then after a while, I realized that I should have been a little bit more courageous at that time. And that's one of the learnings I got. Because the reality with our jobs is that it's science and art, and there's a lot of subjectivity, right? What is cool, what is not cool, what is nice, what is not nice, what is interesting, what is not interesting. But if you're in charge, well, you're in charge. And you're gonna take punches every once in a while, but you've got to stand up for it. So I think that was one of, one of these mistakes. Uh, we will uh, save the other one, because Thank there you. will be a, a discussion about your next uh, salary and promotion. <laughs> uh, Jean-Francois, as a CEO, uh, do, do you consider that recognizing that you, you could have made a mistake, which is something which probably is unbelievable, but who knows, uh, it, it is something that uh, is a strength or a weakness? And can you share with us uh, one of the very, very few exceptional mistakes you could have done in your life? <laughs> which in context were not really mistakes. <laughs> 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 of course, it, it, is, it is a conventional wisdom that you learn from your mistakes and of course everybody makes mistakes including CEOs make mistakes now the whole thing is about how many mistakes you make and if you repeat the same 
mistake, then you would be mistaken in the place you occupy. That is, I think, a general observation. I think the higher you come in the organization, and certainly a CEO directs essentially by giving a direction and choosing people. You evolve in that role from being the captain of a team and playing, scoring goals yourself with a team. And as you go along, you score less of these goals and then you have better players, but you evolve naturally in being the coach of a team. And that's the principal role of a CEO, certainly if you have a longer tenure. And ask Maurice, I don't think he will say, because he, he has even a much more longer ten tenure than I have. It's about the people you select and the trust you give them, the power you give them to realize what they have to do. And you have to choose them to go in a vision that you have. Also, I think it's important that you have to be open to take new elements to your own vision. There's people come with, with great ideas, so you have to remain always very open. And finally, the mistakes then that you make, they're difficult to share because they're always to do with errors of judgments you made about people. And they can have terrible consequences for an organization. And they can be at times very painful. But this is where I think, um, in, in my case, um, I have made uh, mistakes. Now, business-wise, you always make mistakes, but they have to do with, did I do the proper analysis before buying this or that company? But that's most of the time in hindsight. When you do something, it's all rational, it's all well done, and in principle, you have had, had a good judgment. But circumstances later on prove that you were wrong. Now, these things happen also. But I think the, the major mistakes that you make are still, and they are unavoidable, they are about the judgment you make about people, or you don't make, the chances you don't give also can be mistakes, and um, I think that you have to keep an open mind for that, and, uh, and being conscious, conscient uh, about that, that you are a human being, so you have your limitations, and please be aware of that at all times. This is the best conclusion we could have because in the advertising world, if there is something which is uh, of the utmost importance, is clearly the people. And uh, very often we pay lip service to the idea that the people are important and uh, we have to be true uh, to the fact that uh, people are what is making an agency great or poor, what is making an agency d delivering great work or being a subservient to the client and delivering what the client is expecting or demanding, which is not exactly what he does need. And I think that it takes uh, courage to sometimes uh, uh, doing work that the client is not asking for and uh, shaking a little bit up uh, uh, the client and uh, the tree. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, we, we, I'm not sure that we have the right to go beyond the red light, which is here, and it is starting to say, oh, oh, uh, you have to stop. So I would like uh, you to join me in thanking very warmly Jean-François and Alexis. They are great people, doing a great job. Thank you, gentlemen, Jean-Francois Van Boxmeer and Alexis Nazar from Heineken, and of course, Maurice Levy from Publicis. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Insightful conversation. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll see you back in here at 3.15 when we'll be meeting Lowen Partners and Wired magazine. <laughs>